All right, James chapter 3. This morning's passage will be a little smaller than usual, but there's plenty of wealth in it. James 3, 13 through 18. I originally was going to go through James 4, 1, uh, through, 1 through 6, go all the way through James 4, 6, but uh, there was just so much in these six verses here uh, that it didn't think it was profitable going any further. All right. James 3, verse 13. I'm going to read through verse 18 at the end of the chapter. Uh, before we get there, let's, let's talk about last week a little bit. We talked about the tongue and how the tongue itself is not evil. Tongue itself is a piece of flesh, a, a muscle that's in your mouth. Uh, muscles themselves are not evil, but muscles can be used for evil or for good. It's an instrument in your hand, just like your whole body is an instrument in your hand. In fact, our body, what is it made of? It's made of dirt. God made Adam, he breathed, he breathed his life into dirt. And uh, people will tell you that if you look at the composition of the body, it has the same kind of composition that the dirt has. Same minerals. So we, we, that's why we decompose right into the dirt, and it's like we right where we belong. <laughs> so uh, so we, we're from dirt. Dirt itself cannot be sinful. Dirt itself cannot be, even be holy. But the way you use it, uh, I can use dirt and change it into some other kind of composition and create a house for somebody. Or I can take dirt and make it really hard and throw it at someone's head and hurt them. Uh, dirt can be used for good or for, or for evil. But dirt itself is not good or evil, just like your tongue itself is not good or evil. And uh, so we, we found out that when James was saying things like that, that he wasn't saying the tongue itself is evil. But the tongue itself is like a bit in a horse's mouth. That little bit can turn to a large animal whichever way you want it to go. It's like a small rudder on a ship. It turns this thousand foot ship, this 25 foot rudder, turns this thousand foot ship left or right for long distances. The tongue is like a small fire that burns down a whole forest if it's not put out. And the tongue, if it's not tamed by man, can be an unruly evil full of deadly poison. All right, so we, we saw, we saw they can also be, tongue, your tongue shouldn't be, and your life shouldn't be something that gives forth salt water and fresh water. It should be something that gives forth bitter and sweet. Uh, it shouldn't be something that, that gives forth uh, figs and olives. Your life should be stri on the straight and the narrow, giving forth the same fruit, good fruit at all times. That's the whole point. You shouldn't be a double-minded man that's giving forth two kinds of fruits. All right, let's start in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done the weak meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now in the Bible there's two different kinds of wisdom. There's worldly wisdom, And there's heavenly wisdom. Well, those are the two types of wisdom we have here. And we're going to look at in 1 Corinthians here, we're going to look at worldly wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's turn there. And see what God has to say about worldly wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we'll start in verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? 
The wisdom of this world, the, the greatest wisdom of this world is like foolishness in God's sight. But the wisdom of God is what we really need. So we have, we have the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of this world looks at the cross and says, that's foolish. This man died for me. He shed his blood for me. That's, that's foolish. That's what they look at the cross. It's foolishness to them. But the wise look at it and say, oh, thank you, Jesus. You shed your blood for me. I can be forgiven and reconciled to God. That's wisdom that's from above. That's the way they look at it. Okay, but the wisdom of this world is like foolishness in God's sight. And then we have the wisdom of God. Turn to Colossians chapter 2. And we'll start at the very end of verse 2, just so you can get the context of who they're talking about here. The very last word in verse 2 of Colossians 2. It says this. Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now I say this lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. Then go down to verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So all the treasure of wisdom and knowledge is found in who? Christ. Christ. So not only should all our wisdom be based on Christ, but all wisdom comes from Christ. So even an unbeliever, the wisdom they do have comes from Christ. Uh, like, for example, we'll have atheists who talk to us in the open air when we're preaching. And they'll say something like, well, you know, science disproves religion. But let's think about science for a, for a second, okay? we got the word science here. And the word science is defined as what is observable, you can see it with your eyes, what is reproducible, you can test it and do it over and over again. Okay, reproducible, testable, and observable. So you're testing, you're reproducing, it's happening over and over again. And once something happens over and over again the same way, what do we say? Well, that must be the way the world is. You know, I take a marker, I drop it. I take a marker, I drop it. That must be gravity. That must be the way the world works. But let's look at it from the position of an atheist who doesn't believe in God. Now, an atheist is a human being. He has limited knowledge. No human being, in the human being in the world has all the knowledge in the world, right? And each human being began at some point in time. Malachi began six years ago. Emily began four years ago. They began. Before that, they, they didn't exist. So they don't have all the knowledge in the world, and they're not every place at one, at one time at all times, okay? So for them to say, they drop it, like, let's say they did it a thousand times, they drop the marker. Well, this is the way the world works. Well, how do they know that? How do they know over in Australia it doesn't work a different way? See, now they're claiming to make an absolute truth claim. When you say something is an absolute truth claim, absolute, you're saying it definitely is this way. Absolutely means that depth, this is the way gravity is. No matter, this is the way. And I don't care what you say. I don't care what he says. I don't care what she says. This is the way the world works. Okay? But for them to do that, if they don't have all knowledge there is in the world, even if they had all knowledge in the world, they had to be everywhere at one time to be able to see how the world is working at one time. So they may say, well, in Australia right now, I, I just did a test in Australia, and they said it works this way. But that was at that moment in time. See, now I have to be everywhere at one time, every place in the universe at one time, and have all knowledge of everything in the universe at one time to make any kind of absolute claim about anything. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm not, I don't have all knowledge. I can't be everywhere at one time. And what this is called, having all knowledge is called omniscient. It's the fancy word for it, omniscient. Omni means all, science means knowledge. All knowledge. And being everywhere at one time is called omnipresent. Let me write those on the board so you can see them with your eyes. Omniscient. Omniscient and omnipresent. So you get omni in both words. Omni means all. And then you have science right here. 
and you have present. So all, all knowledge, science means knowledge, all knowledge, all present, you're all everywhere at one time. And to make an absolute claim about anything, anything in the world, you have to be qualified at these two places. Are you that? Am I that? Who's the only person who's both these things? So, do you see how foolish it is for a, an atheistic scientist to make an absolute claim about anything? He's claiming God doesn't exist. So, the only way you can claim, with all assurance, an absolute claim that something is true, is to either be this two, these two things, which none of us are, or know somebody who is both of these things, and that person reveals the truth to you. But guess what? Atheists don't know God, do they? But they're claiming absolute things all the time. This is the way the world is. Well, how do you know that? Oh, because I've done experiments. How many experiments have you done? Oh, a couple thousand. What about the guy over in Russia who's had different experiments than you? He had different conclusions. But he doesn't even know about that guy, because he doesn't have all knowledge about everybody in the world. So these atheistic scientists are just foolish. They don't get it. That when they make a claim, an absolute claim, guess what they're doing? They're pretending to be a Christian. They're pretending without even knowing it to be a Christian. Because the only way you can be, you can make an absolute claim is to actually be a Christian and know the God of the universe. That's the only way. Go ahead. What's that? Right, but if they're claiming to be God, they have to be these two things. And if they claim to be these two things, they're foolish. Because they know they began at some point in time. And they know they can't be everywhere at one time. And even Thomas Edison, the great inventor, who himself was a theist, believes that he only had less than one-tenth of one percent of all the knowledge in the world. So they're claiming to be wiser than him, which is uh, kind of foolish. So that's the worldly wisdom. It's, and, and isn't it foolish? Isn't it foolish to say you know something, absolutely, but not be these two things or not know God who is these two things? It's foolish. That's what we try to show them on college campuses, that it's just foolish to do those two things. So you have this worldly wisdom. But the word, let me just put the Greek word for wisdom here on the board. I'm going to see if, if you can actually uh, sound that out for me. You, you'll know most of the words in it, I think, most of the letters in it. Okay. Anyone remember what the sound for this one is? The a. That's, a, that's a sigma, which is like an S. Okay. This is just like an O. It's called an Omicron. This is a phi, or a phi. It has a PH sound. PH. And this, I, I put a little too much of an end on there. That's actually an I, or an iota. And this is an alpha, or an A. So, Sophia. That's the Greek word for wisdom. Sophia. Now, in that first passage we read, or in the second passage we read in Colossians, we talked about philosophy. Now, the philosophy is actually a transliterated word. Now, we talked about transliterated before. Let me write that word on the board so you can kind of get a, a, you know, a gauge for this. trans lit er eight. Okay, transliterate. Transliterate simply means I take the Greek word or a word in any language and bring it into the English and say it. So, to transliterate Sophia would be to do this. That's the transliteration of Sophia. Okay? Now, if I actually translate it, I would say wisdom. That's right. You're getting it. Okay, so this, this, is, this right here is a transliteration of Sophia. This is the translation of Sophia Wisdom. Now, philosophy, the word we have, English word we have, philosophy, is the transliteration of two Greek words. The second part is Sophie. Which word is that transliterating? Sophia. The first word is philo, which means brotherly love. So it's, philosophy is actually, if you're going to translate it, is love of wisdom. Love of wisdom. That's what philosophy is. You love wisdom. So there's, there's different kinds of philosophies in the world. And when, we, when me and your dad and other people are in the open air, we deal with philosophy all the time. And if you look in Colossians, that chapter 2, verse 8, it talks about philosophy according to, the, according to the world. 
But we're dealing with, that's a philosophy that, that takes God out of the picture. I'm an atheist and I'm going to engage in philosophy. Foolishness. Foolishness. I'm a Christian, I'm going to engage in philosophy. Yes, that's true philosophy. That's true philosophy because you're loving wisdom. The wisdom that's from God, that only can be from God. Okay, so we've got worldly wisdom. We, just, we looked at that and we looked at the wisdom that's, that's heavenly. That's found in Colossians. Chapter 2 and verses, the first part of 2 and 3 and then verse 8. Which is all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge is found in Christ. Christ Jesus. Okay, so we have worldly wisdom and earthly wisdom. Let's go back to our passage here in James. So if you have the wisdom of God, and you have the understanding of God, and this is probably just for John's edification here, but the word for understanding here, the Greek word is epistemon. We're epistemology, that's right. Epistemology is the study of how do you know what you know? How do you know it? And some people, their epistemology will be empiricism, which says, I know what I know through my five senses. Through my five senses. I know what I know by seeing, touching, tasting, smelling, and hearing. That's how I know what I know. But if, we're, if atheism is true, and we're a product of evolution, over millions of years we became from this little you know, goo, to fish, to amphibians, to reptiles, to birds, to mammals, and now human beings. If that is true, do they have any reason to trust their five senses are working properly? No, because there's no intelligent being behind it. It's simply this random chance. And if random chance is behind your five senses, your eyes, your nose, your ears, your taste, your touch, you have no right to trust in your five senses. It's foolishness to trust in your five senses. So the epistemology of empiricism, which says, I know what I know through my five senses, but there's no God, is foolishness. Foolishness. I have no reason, no right to trust in my five senses. So the word for understanding, the Greek word for understanding here is epistemology, which is where we get epistemology from. So how do you know if someone is wise in understanding from a truly godly perspective? What does it say in that second part of verse 13? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of of wisdom. You show you are really wise, not by having all this head knowledge. Remember we said, head knowledge without practicality, living that head knowledge out means what? It means greater condemnation. Knowledge without doing it means greater condemnation. You're better off being a fool if you're not going to obey God. You're better off knowing as little as you can if you're not going to know God because the more you know, the less you, diso less you obey, the more condemnation there will be for you in the end. The meekness of... Now, the word meekness here, people misunderstand meekness. They think meekness means weakness. They think meekness means uh, uh, maybe like a self-deprecating uh, humility. P always putting yourself down. That's what meekness <laughs> means. So, yeah, I, I just sit every day, you know... Are you really sitting every day? Then you need to get rid of it. But if you aren't, then don't say that. That's false humility. Humility is not, or meekness here, which is the same, basically the same thing as humility, uh, not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. It's not overly impressed by your own self-importance. Oh, I'm really important. That's not meekness. Yes? Uh, I understood it to be uh, power under... Under control. control. Right, yeah, they, of, they often used it as uh, to describe a, an animal, a wild animal who had been tamed. Or a wild horse had been broken. Now he's, a power, he's always been a powerful horse. He didn't lose any power in the process. He's just being controlled. His power is being controlled now. We do that to ourselves. Right, it's self-control. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's, it means that too. But the main, the main definition of it, which really goes along with that, is not being overly impressed by a one's self-importance. It's humility. Okay? And humility is power. Because I, I, could, I could say, yeah, I'm important. And I have the power to say that. But I'm not going to say that. God's important. We want to glorify God. Give glory to Him. Like John the Baptist said when Jesus was ministry was getting bigger and bigger. He says, I must decrease, He must increase. 
That should be our attitude at all times when it comes to God. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Let me give you a story here. It's a common story found in traditional churches these days. Let's say a position opens in the church for a Sunday school teacher. Okay? And the pastor makes the announcement from the pulpit, hey, uh, we have an opening for Sunday school teacher for 5th and 6th grade students. And, uh, you know, we need you to come forward and, and let us know and, you know, speak up. So five people come forward and they speak up and they say they want it. And they only need one person. And these five people hear about these other people, you know, trying to apply for this position. And one guy says, well, I want a better teacher than he is and than she is. And this other person says, well, I'm, I got a better personality. This person here says, I've worked with kids before. I have six kids at home. I know what I'm doing. Is that the right attitude to have? That's bitter envy or... Bitter jealousy, no word for envy here. Bitter jealousy and selfishness in their hearts. Is that the kind of wisdom that comes from God? That's so what these five people should say. So I'm going to pray about it. And uh, if God tells me, no, it's not my time, then I, I stepped up on accident. I shouldn't have stepped up. And just step back. And pray that the Lord's will is done. And pray that the pastor will have wisdom to pick the right person. The exact person for the job. And then maybe even see, well, that person is a better teacher than me. Maybe I, maybe I should let him do it. Well, that person, I, I don't have any kids. I don't really, I've not been a teacher before. This person has lots of kids. This person has been teaching before. Maybe I should step back. That's godly wisdom. That's meekness. That's humility. That's what we just talked about. The meekness of wisdom. But bitter envy and self-seeking your heart is wrong. Or to say, well, you know, I'm better at dodgeball than that person. I'm better at soccer than that person. I'm not going to pass to that person. I'm going to score the goal. I'm the better player. That's selfishness. Or for someone to say, well, why don't you pass it to me? And, and to really assume what their motives are. To assume the reason why they're not passing is because, oh, they think they're better than me. That's the wrong motive to have as well. We need to have the right motive. We need to think the best of someone before we think the worst of somebody. Because can we see into someone's heart and know exactly what they're thinking? Or know what their motivations are? No, we can't. So we need to think of the best person and say, well, and maybe even ask them a question. Well, why didn't you pass it to me? Oh, because I had a great shot. Oh, okay, no big deal. And that's, and that's where, so we need to be, we're not be selfish in our hearts or jealous in our hearts, but be meek. Meek in our hearts. And when you're not meek, that's where jealousy and envy comes from. Jealousy comes from. That's where bitterness comes from. That's where uh, selfishness comes from. It's when you're not meek in your heart. We need to be meek in our hearts. And it says in verse 15, where this wisdom comes from. This wisdom does not descend from above. And we learned earlier in James, in James 1 17, every good and perfect gift comes from above. So if this isn't coming from above, is it good or perfect? Nope. That's right. Let's see where it comes from. It is earthly, sensual, demonic? Wow, that's some strong words. Wisdom that's not meek is demonic. Let's call it what it is. It's not a mistake. It's not an oops. It's demonic. And what you have here is the trinity of sin. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Earthly, sensual, demonic. World, flesh, and devil. And that's the trinity of sin you have to deal with the rest of your life. Temptation. The rest of your life from these three sources. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world is wicked. It is sinful. And, you, and then once you start maybe coming to the open air with me and your dad, you'll see how wicked and sinful it is. Really wicked. It's fleshly. It's demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, <clears throat> confusion and every evil thing are there. Is God the author of confusion? God's a God of order. So if I were to visit a church traditional church is what I'm talking about here and there's confusion there there's a discombobulation there to use another word if there's confusion there then there's probably some kind of problems there people fighting over things that just don't make any sense there's confusion there that does not come from above that comes from envy and self-seeking envy and self-seeking this kind of wisdom comes from earthly Sensual, demonic wisdom. That's where it comes from. And when you have envy or jealousy and selfishness, 
confusion and every evil thing will be there. So we need to check our hearts. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it's the wellspring of life. Guard your heart above all else, for it's the wellspring of life. But the wisdom that's from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Let's look at what God says about wisdom. We'll turn to Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10. Proverbs 9.10 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And if you fear God, what will you do? You will obey God. So wisdom, obedience, this goes back to, to verse 13 here, let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if someone doesn't fear God, are they wise? What are they? Yeah. Foolish. They're foolish if they don't fear God. And how do you know if someone's fearing God or not? Whether well, they're obeying Him or not. So disobedient people are fools. That's what they are. That's just the biblical truth. It's not name-calling. It's describing a person. They're foolish. In God's eyes. And then let's turn to Matthew chapter... What's that? I was just going to say in, in verse 10 there at the end of this is, and the knowledge of the Holy One is epistemology. Yeah. And the Greek would say that, yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. Let's see what the Lord Jesus Christ says about this. This is the very end of his Sermon on the Mount. This is almost like his altar call, per se. Him giving his final call to his listeners to take action. Matthew 7, 24. Whoever, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, so they have knowledge, they've heard it, hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who's built his house on a rock. So if you hear Jesus' words and do them, you are a wise man who built his house on the rock. But what happens if you hear them and don't do them? But everyone in verse 26, everyone who hears these sayings of mine, they've heard him, and does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. How foolish it would be to build your house on the sand. What would have happened to this house if instead of a cement concrete foundation with all this wind you had in the first couple months you were here, it was built on sand? It'd be down there in the valley somewhere. He wouldn't have your house. You'd be living in there with a deer. That's where he'd be living right now. And the windows are out there working on the, on the, uh, the front of the house right there. And they, as they go deeper, guess what? There's still cement. A deep foundation. And the deeper the foundation goes, guess what? The stronger the house will be upon the foundation that it's upon. So those who hear and do. Which, and this is just exactly what James said in, uh, at the beginning of, of James, chapter 1. Verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. It's like a person looked in the mirror and walked away and forgot what they look like. Walk up the, you woke up this morning and, oh, my hair's out to here and I got dirt over here in my face. I got some slobber right here. I got some snot right here. I got some stuff in my teeth. My teeth got yellow stuff on my breath stings. And then you walk away and it's like, oh, I'm okay. You forgot what you look like. Uh, can I ask you a question? Sure. Well, I mean, I mean, if you're going to relate to a spiritual side, it's pretty foolish, too. I mean, obviously, in the natural world, it's not that big a deal. I mean, who really cares? But it's, it, James used an example here to approve something. I mean, it's like a spiritual man who looks at himself, he sees himself in light of God's law, and sees how much he's fallen short, and he says, oh, no big deal. I'm going to hell. No big deal. Judgment day, no big deal. That's what it's like. Yeah. It's even more foolish. It's infinitely more foolish than looking in the mirror and saying, oh, no big deal. To know and then yeah. deny it. Yeah. That's right. So that's the kind of wisdom we're talking about. That's godly wisdom. Uh, and then, um, let's see. Let's, and this is, that is from above is first pure. Let's turn to Matthew 5.8. This 
this is the Beatitudes, and you see that he kind of goes along with these Beatitudes quite a, quite a bit. It's his half-brother, I guess he kind of looked up to him a little bit, huh? <laughs> but, uh, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Where are you at? Matthew 5. Five okay. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So you have to be pure in heart if you want to see God in the end. Not in judgment. You want to see Him as a friend. And then in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, it says, uh, this is Paul speaking here, For I am jealous for you, to the, Cor the Corinthian church, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste or pure virgin to Christ. Same Greek word there, translated as chaste in New King James. So, does God want a wicked, sinful bride? Think about it. You get engaged to somebody, and they go out and live in sin with someone else. Do you still want to marry them? God wants a pure, pure bride. And we are his bride. He is a bridegroom. It's only an analogy there, but he wants a pure bride. He doesn't want a bride that's continually cheating on him before they even get married. And the wedding feast is in the end. It's in the end, when you persevere to the end. So that's what God, God wants to... So the wisdom from above is, is pure in two senses. First, it's pure because it's from God. All wisdom from God must be pure because He's the all-wise one. He must give you pure, completely pure wisdom with no lie, no non-wisdom in it because it's from God. And secondly, that same wisdom that you receive should cause you to be pure. Otherwise, you're a fool. You're a fool. So it's pure wisdom and it should cause you to be pure. Pure. And then peaceable. Let's turn to Romans chapter 12. Wisdom from above is peaceable. Romans chapter 12, and let's look at verse 17. It says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In this world... Especially if you engage with what me and your dad engage with all the time, open air preaching, witnessing to the lost, you'll have the temptation to overcome evil with evil. Someone comes to you and spits in your face, you might have the temptation to spit back. Someone comes to you and smacks your Bible out of your hand, you might want to pick your Bible up and hit it over the head with it. He might be tempted to do that. That's evil. That's repaying evil with evil. But rather pay evil with good. God bless you. And keep on preaching. No big deal. Keep on preaching. And it'll do one or two things for them. Talking about this heaping burning coals on their head. Either they're going to have a worse judgment day for doing this thing to a servant of God. Or this will cause them to say, why is this guy being so loving to me even though I'm being so wicked to him? And good will overcome evil, maybe, in their case. They'll see it and say, and this is what a Christian is like, this must be what Christ is like. A kind Savior, a merciful Savior, a loving Savior, who even though I've done so, so many wicked things against Him, He's willing to forgive me anyway. And treat me with kindness. So we don't overcome evil with good. The Lord Jesus said that if you only do good to your friends, what better are you than the heathen? Even the heathen are good to their friends and family. But if you pray for your enemies and do good to them, then you've become a then you're acting like a child of God. You're acting as you should. May I say something? Yeah. I have a friend up in Quebec. Or near Quebec. Uh, uh, Frenchman. Mm -hmm. Speak fluent English, fluent Spanish, or uh, French. French, right? And he's about five foot seven, five foot six. And uh, he was doing the same thing as you probably do. And some guy come up to me, he's about six foot four or six foot three or something. 
He says, are you truly a Christian? He says, yeah. And he paused and he punched them in the mouth. Uh -huh. Knocked them over. Mm -hmm. Right? And it hurt, he said. He got up and he, he, he walked up to him and he turned his other side. And, you, know, Chief, you want more? Yeah. And he said, you mean you really do that? Let me hit the other side. He says, that's what the Lord says to do. And that fellow he didn't hit him and he said, Boy, I sure am glad you didn't hit me a second time when he killed me. Right. But he was big. And he, he said that fellow become a Christian because of his attitude, his ways, and it become good friend or best of friends. That's great. So the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. That's right. What you were just saying is exactly right. Uh, when I think back on my friend. Right. Amen. That's a good testimony. Thanks for sharing that. That's exactly what we're talking about. Uh, last year at Belshire, which we were going, to, going in a couple of days, actually tomorrow, <laughs> uh, your dad was preaching and the guy took his hat, pushed your dad's head, put his hat on the ground, stomped on his hat. How do you think your dad responded? Did he hit him in the face? Did he get mad at him? No, he, he just kept on preaching and said, God bless you. <coughs> now, I don't know what the result of that guy is. Maybe we'll see him again this year. But whether it has an impact on a person or not, we hope it does. We're called to act that way no matter what. Well, it has an impact of one, one way or the other. Right, right. I'm, I'm saying impact for the good. Yeah. Whether, impact, whether they get saved or not, whether it impacts them for the good or not, we need to act that way. Turn to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, and verse 24. I this morning when I was praying that uh, we'd see him this year. And I was hoping that he would be heard him. Yeah, we, we, I can definitely remember his face in my mind. And of course, we had the video of it, but I'm uh, studying two Timothy, two Timothy now. This is a really good verse. You just missed me by one. I already read that. One. Especially, this is a good verse, especially for open air preachers. I think some of us fail in this. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perchance will grant them repentance, so they may know the truth. They may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. There's that word humility again, which means, once again, not thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to. And, but I want to focus on the word here for quarrel. It's a Greek word. Yeah. yeah, it's the same word there. That's a sloppy, sloppy M now. Meet. Okay. So here we have the Greek word for coral here. Okay, now we have a mu, which is an M, an alpha, which is an A. This is a chi, which is a CH. O is Omicron. That's an O. A mu, which is M, and a, a, which is alpha, and an iota, which is I. Macho my. Let's take off the my on the end here. Macho. And this is the problem with most people who like to quarrel. They want to be macho. They think macho means I'm a man. Macho comes from the Greek word for quarreling. Some men think fighting makes them a man. Did Jesus fight? What happened when uh, Peter picked out his sword on the day that Jesus was arrested? He told him to put it away. Peter cut the ear off first, and what did Jesus do in return? He healed the person's ear. So is it macho? Is, is, I mean, are you being a man by being macho? Not, not in the true sense of the word. Maybe in worldly wisdom, being macho is being a man. But in heavenly wisdom, being macho is not being a man. So we shouldn't be combative. We shouldn't be quarrelsome. We should be gentle, meek, able to teach, patient. Doesn't, now, this doesn't mean we can't rebuke. It doesn't mean we can't rebuke hard. I mean, look, look at Jesus. One of his strongest rebukes is found in the temple courts when he's turning over the tables. This is supposed to be a house of prayer. You've turned into a den of robbers, a den of thieves, a house of merchants. 
And I think if Jesus came into the prosperity church today where they're trying to make money off of God, God wants you to be rich, but make me rich in the process. God wants you to be rich, but make me rich. Give me all your money. And God would probably do the, Jesus would probably do the same thing to them. It makes them angry. And there's such thing as righteous anger. But we shouldn't be quarrelsome. We shouldn't try to start a fight with somebody. We shouldn't be trying to provoke them to fight us. We need to be humble. Humility. Now, if, we, if our intention or heart is just to rebuke them out of love and they try to fight back, it's not our fault. I'm not saying we shouldn't rebuke. But we shouldn't be quarrelsome. We shouldn't be a macho man. Or a macho woman, which is kind of an oxymoron. Um, women shouldn't be... I mean, none of us should be fighting, but... Even in society's ideas, a woman fighting is, is wrong. So it goes way beyond even society. So we shouldn't be macho my. Servant of the Lord must not be macho my, but be gentle to all, able to teach, and patient. Able to teach and patient. Okay, let's go back to James. Yeah, we're not of this world, as Jesus said. If we were, we would fight. We don't need to pour gas on, on that. Right. Fire. right. Right. So, as it is in with your power, as it says in Romans 12, be at peace with all men. As much as it is within your, within your power. But is this peace at any price? No. Let's turn to Matthew 10. See what Jesus said about peace. Not peace at any price. If a sinner comes to me and doesn't like my message, but I'm preaching the truth, should I stop preaching my message? Should I fluff it up? Should I take some of the hard parts out of it? Let sinners go to hell? That, and that would be peace at any price to do that. But not peace at any price. Matthew 10, verse 34. Do not think I came to bring peace on earth. Whoa. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He, he who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. It's not peace at any price. If someone threatens your life, if you don't stop becoming a Christian, if you don't stop being a Christian, you don't stop becoming a Christian to have peace with that person. You die in the faith. If so, be it. You don't fluff up your message to have peace with people. So many pastors, quote-unquote pastors, they're wolves in sheep's clothing in this, in this in America. They'll, they'll change the message of the Bible to make the people feel better. They're called ear, ear ticklers. Oh, that's what I want to hear. I'm okay with God. I can be a fornicator, drunkard, and still be a Christian. That's what I want to hear. And it makes them feel good. Is it going to feel good in the end? They're going to go to hell in the end. And they'll hate their pastor in the end. They might have loved their pastor during that life because, oh, that makes me feel good. I can have my sin and have God at the same time. But eternity, they're going to hate that pastor. They're going to cry out his name for all of eternity from the lake of fire because he didn't tell them the truth. And there's so many people who just, they go, oh, I, I want to have a big church. And, and the whole point is, well, let's have a big church. Let's make people in this building as possible twice a week. And that's peace at any price. Crystal Cathedral. Crystal Cathedral. Yeah. Yeah, Robert Schuller. He's one of them. He's an ear tickler. Joel Osteen is an ear tickler. They tickle your ears. They, they tell you what you want to hear. Be careful as a person. It's going to get worse and worse. We haven't even seen it yet in America, I don't think. It's going to get worse and worse. People are departing from the faith every day. So, not peace at any price. Within your power, all power you have, to not obey God at the same time, be at peace with men. But guess what Jesus said? I did not come to learn peace, but a sword. You bring the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God out there, it cuts people, and they're going to hate you for it. And just because, and this is what we hear in opening all the time, well, look at the reaction from the crowd, you must be doing something wrong. Man, have you ever read the Bible? What happened to the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the most holy man that ever lived? 
He was crucified. He must have done something wrong according to your philosophy. Paul the Apostle was stoned and left for dead at the city gates. He must have done something wrong according to your philosophy. No, 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 no. The Word of God will turn the world upside down. It won't always bring peace to your, to your own little person in the world. In fact, I would say this. If you are at peace with all men, there's probably something wrong with your life. Because we should be salt and light in this world, and the salt is a sting in the wound of the world. You ever put a salt on one of your cuts before? It doesn't feel good, does it? It burns. It burns. And when the sinful world sees a holy person preaching holiness, uplifting the holy God, reading the holy Bible and believing it, it's going to be a sting in their sin. They're going to hate it. But oh, we must continue on anyway. Salt also preserves it. That's right. So if they hear it, it may preserve them. It may preserve them. Yeah, not only in that sense, but remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham went back and forth with God. If there's ten righteous people, will you destroy the city? No, no, no. So having righteous people in America is preserving America from enduring the full wrath of God because of how wicked we are. It's preserving the wicked along with the righteous because God's not willing to destroy the righteous with the wicked. So it's, it's peaceable, it's gentle. And the word for gentle here is a different word than the, the word earlier in this passage. It just means kind and considerate. Kind and considerate. It just means you're, you're thinking of the person first. You're courteous. You're thinking of them before you're thinking of yourself. You know, if you're just running on your own little motor here, uh, you walk by an older lady, you don't open the door for her at a restaurant, and it's such in her face. That wasn't kind, that wasn't courteous, that wasn't gentle. Willing to yield, you're submissive. You're teachable. It, you, you know, in all of life, whether it's at home, or at a job, or at, if you go to college later on, or, or in any other, any other situation, I'm just saying, any other situation, you're going to have authorities over top of you. And of course, there's always God over top of you. God's your authority. You need to be submissive. And we should never get to this point, well, I know everything. You can't teach me anything. God forbid I ever have that attitude. You know, even a new Christian can teach me something. I've been a Christian for 12 years now. Even a new Christian can teach me something. Must be teachable, humble, willing to yield, full of mercy. And what does Matthew 5, 7 say? We're going back to the Beatitudes once again. He kind of goes along with this a little bit here. Matthew 5, 7, he says, Blessed are those who are merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. We talked about that, I think it was three or four sermons ago. We talked about all your sins. And I used that, that dot effect. We have all the sins on the board here. All your sins. There they are. They're all there. And God says, well, I'll forgive you of those. And he wipes them out. And someone commits uh, one sin against you. And uh, you're not merciful though. You don't forgive him for it. You don't understand mercy. You've done all these things against God, and he says, okay, I'll wipe them out. I'll forgive you. But one, some of those one thing is like, ah, why'd you do that to me? Wrong attitude. That's not mercy. That's not mercy. But the parable of the unmerciful servant. We already read that a couple sermons ago. It happens to me sometimes. I have a difficult time getting that out of my head. What does that mean? Oh, I mean, you're, you're definitely being tempted by it, but what you need to do, to, the solution to this problem of not being merciful is to dwell on the mercy of God. Okay. You dwell on the mercy of God and how merciful He's been to you. You think about your past life. How can we not be merciful in, in return to anyone and everyone? Mm -hmm. If we've, it looks to say, for example, uh, I've committed a thousand crimes against God. Let's just give, it, just give it a round number. A thousand crimes against God. And he forgives them all. And someone commits one crime against me. Their crime against me is one, th one one thousandth of what I've done against God. How dare I hold it against them? How dare I not be merciful to them? If God's shown me mercy, I should be merciful to them as well. And by being... Well, you're definitely tempted, but you shouldn't keep giving into it. Well, I'm saying it's a working thing that you've got to get this out of your mind. That you should get even or however you That's get. right. Okay. Yeah, you got to get it out of your head. It's definitely... And for some people, it's more of temptation than others. And uh, the more you submit to the truth, instead of giving into it, the easier it becomes not to give into it. But the more you give into it, you're developing a habit of, this is normal for me, and then you keep on giving into it. 
Yeah, so it, I mean, when I first, like I said, when I first became saved, I was, I was a drunkard. I had a problem with drunkenness before I got, became a Christian. Beca became a Christian, and, uh, you know, if I would have went in a bar, I probably would have went back to my drunkenness. If I would have hung out with my buddies so I got drunk with every weekend, I probably would have went back to my drunkenness. But I separated from them for a time, and six months later, I can go around them while they're drinking and witness to them and preach to them. Because God has strengthened me. It was no longer a temptation to me. And it's not even close. I mean, it's, I don't even think about it now. I mean, even at that point in time, I might be tempted a little bit, but now I'm not tempted at all. In fact, it disgusts me. And that's the progression you take when you become a Christian. The tempta things you used to be involved in, they, were, they become a temptation, a strong, they become a weak temptation, then they become no temptation, then they become disgusting and abhorrent to you. Okay. It's the kind of progression you take. But we should. Fortifying your conviction from the first place. Right, it's, it's you're reversing what, reversing what you did for however many years you were a sinner. Mm -hmm. For 19 years, I, I lived a wicked life. Well, for most of those 19 years, anyway, and I have to reverse it. And I call it going through detox. You know, when someone's a drug addict, they have to go through detox. Mm -hmm. And usually, they put them in a room and and they're in isolation for days and maybe even weeks. And they just have this craving in, this, in their body, and their craving is metaphysical. Their body itself, their brain is craving this thing, this reaction it gets from these drugs it's taking. But as you train your body, no, that's not right. It starts to get it. And then that temptation goes away because you're reversing the metaphysical nature of your body. You can get addicted to any kind of sin, not just drugs. Any kind of sin can be addicted because... When you do a sinful thing, there's pleasure in it, and your brain says, oh, that feels good. And you get addicted to that feeling you get in your brain, those neurons firing in your brain. You get addicted to that feeling. And they have to reverse it and say, no, that's wrong. Now, of course, after you get that good feeling, you feel shame and guilt and remorse, and why did I do that? That's what you should feel. If you don't feel it after sin, you're probably reprobate. But you should feel it after sin. But the, the point is to, to not give in to it in the first place. You don't have to feel the pleasure. Not only that, but not only the, sh not the shame and the guilt afterwards. Mm -hmm. There's a reversal taking place. Mm -hmm. so, so sin becomes a more metaphysical thing. The, the, the addiction to it, the temptation to it, becomes a metaphysical thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So full of mercy... Oh, something want to say? No, no, I'm sorry. Okay. Full of mercy and good fruits. Turn to John 15. What was that? John 15. Full of mercy and good fruits. Parable of the vine. Jesus says in John 15, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father the vine dresser. So who's the vine? Jesus. Who's the vine, who's the vine dresser, the vine keeper? The Father. So he's taking care of the vine. Every branch in me, which is Christians, that does not bear fruit. What does he do to them? He takes them away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. A good vine dresser will prune the, the, the branches that are gaining so they can continue to grow and be more fruitful. But the ones that aren't bearing fruit, guess what? I'm going to cut it down. And he says uh, down in verse 6, If anyone does not abide in me, and the word abide means remain in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. So you, if you're bearing fruit, he'll trim you up so you can bear more fruit. But if you're not bearing fruit, it's like you're not even attached to the vine anyway, so what's the point of even keeping you there? You're just taking up space. I'm going to cut you off and throw you into the fire. It's all you're good for is firewood. So you'd be full of good fruit if you have this wisdom that James is talking about, this godly wisdom, this heavenly wisdom, this wisdom from above. Uh, you'll, have, you'll be pure, be peaceable, be gentle, be willing to yield or submissive, and full of mercy and good fruits. Without partiality, without hypocrisy. Partiality here is not saying, well, I think this person's better than this person. It's saying, I'm not going this way and that way at the same time. It's the same thing as saying hypocrisy. And the Greek word for hypocrite is, is the same word used for an actor. When you see a movie, and you see someone acting, is that who they really are in real life? They're playing a part. They learned it. They trained themselves. They memorized their part. They even know the actions, the emotions. They, some some uh, actors even make themselves cry on, on cue. Can you make yourself cry? Well, I can't do that. They can make themselves cry on cue. Uh, they can make themselves do all kinds of things. But it's all pretending. Are they really crying? Are they really sad? 
Are they really this person who they're playing? No, and that's what a hypocrite is. They're pretending to be a Christian, but in real reality, in reality, they're not a Christian. You can tell by the way they're living their life. No one else may know about it. Everyone else in the world may think, well, he's, that's the best Christian in the world. But in the deep darkness, where no one else is, they see it. God sees it, and he knows they're a hypocrite. And they know they're a hypocrite. And them and God may be the only ones who know they're a hypocrite, but they're a hypocrite. And they won't go to heaven in the end. They'll go to hell in the end. Good example, modern day example, is a guy named Ted Haggard. Pastor out in Colorado, a huge church. Lots of people, thousands of people going there every week. 10,000, I think. He was the, the leader of a nationally evangelical association which incorporates 27,000 churches. And none of these people knew it. But the other side, he was living a homosexual relationship and he was doing drugs. The only people that knew were him, the guy he was doing these things with, and God. His own wife didn't even know. His own children didn't even know. What a hypocrite. What a pretender. And he preached against all this. Oh, yeah. And, and then, and then he, he was part of this uh, movement that says we shouldn't have homosexual marriage. And he, he, was, he was a big part of Focus on the Family, which is really against homosexual marriage. What is his name? Ted Haggard. <laughs> Ted Haggard. That's hypocrisy. Not genuineness. Finally, now the fruit of righteousness, which is the goal, righteousness, holiness, the fruit of it is sown in peace by those who make peace. So you have the fruit of righteousness is the good fruit that proves you're, you're remaining in the vine of Jesus, that you have heavenly wisdom, not earthly wisdom. Heavenly wisdom, not demonic wisdom. That's, that, that's the proof. That's the fruit we need. It's sown in peace by those who make peace. It's sown in peace by those who make peace. You know that Jesus spoke against hypocrisy probably more than anything else? And just in Matthew alone, he talked against hypocrisy 14 times. He can't stand hypocrisy. So righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. We need to have godly wisdom, wisdom from above, not earthly wisdom, not demonic wisdom. And the godly wisdom that we should have is shown by our life, once again. And he gives some of the fruits uh, of that life.